The scripture reading this morning is from Ephesians 4, 29 through 32. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may be benefit that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. The word of God for the people of God. I think if you were to ask the vast majority of people if they would like to have a good life or a bad life, I think the vast majority of people would say, I would prefer a good life rather than a bad life. Um, and of course, we'd all define that a little differently, what means good life and what are the qualities of a good life. But as I think about that, I think about a life that is full, a life that's rich, a life that's rewarding, a life that is significant, or at least you feel like it's significant. It's probably encompassed in that understanding that we get out of the gospel writers where Jesus talks about not just life but abundant life, a life that is full and rich and rewarding. I think for the vast majority of people who want a life like that, a major part of that life revolves around the significant relationships that we have and hold, the significant people who are a part of our world and a part of our lives, the people that we would say we love and the people who we believe love us back. And it doesn't mean that it's equal, it doesn't mean that it's all the same, because we see that in a lot of different forms. We have special relationships with parents and children and spouses and extended family and close friends, and all those things look a little different. But we would really be talking about this dynamic that I talked about a little bit with the children of what it means to live a life where you feel like there are people you can love and there are people who love you. And I think a lot of the quality of our life at any one moment revolves around the health of those relationships. When those relationships are strong, when the most important relationships of our life are rich and full, when the most important relationships of our life are healthy and good, then I think if there were a richness meter on our lives that we could say, okay, my life is well over in the rich side because these really important relationships which are so central to the purpose of my life are good and positive, then you and I would feel like, I have good life. That's really good. I think the opposite is true too. I think when the really important relationships of our lives are broken, and when they're hard, and when they're difficult, and when we feel separation because of that, I think many times we feel the quality of our life is diminished by that. That our life isn't as good, it's, it, it, it isn't as blessed. And I think sometimes, depending on how difficult that gets, our life moves from a situation of being positive and a blessing to being challenging and a burden. God knows this about us. God created us this way. God created us with this desire to care deeply for each other and the desire to feel like we are cared for deeply by each other. And I think in that, the whole idea of faith community becomes a central factor of the whole createdness of God in creating a world and a world order, a way to live 
that helps to facilitate and nurture that. I think for the last couple of thousand years, it has been a primary function of Christian community, of Christian faith community, to create an environment where those kind of relationships can be developed and can be nurtured. That the Christian community is a place where we should be able to come and feel like we're valued, we're loved, we're important, we're significant, and where we also have those people that we love deeply and we care about. And we are connected with their world and connected with their lives. And Christian community helps to create an environment where those things happen because those are really important in our lives. Those are some of the major things which make our lives rich and full and rewarding. Now, you don't have to be around church very long to realize we don't get it right all the time. And that's true, we don't. I've been around church all my life, I know that's true. We don't get it right all the time. I also know a church is an organization of people, and people aren't perfect, and we're going to get it wrong every once in a while. But it also is my life experience that we get it right a whole lot more than we get it wrong. And that for the vast majority of people who give themselves and invest themselves in faith community, that this becomes a reality for them, that they know that out of their own life experience. I think this is so important to God that when you read the Bible, you find the elements of how to work with this and create this in your own world, in your own life, and how to create it in Christian community on a regular basis. It's in the Old Testament, but it's probably easier to see it in the New Testament, in the Gospels, and especially in the epistle letters. And so today... I pulled out one text out of many that I could have looked at and said, this is a text which helps to give us the tools to understand how is it that we create such a community that helps to be a place where the most important relationships in our lives are valued and are nurtured and are made important so that our lives are enriched in response to that. I want us to take a little bit of time this morning and look at the text. I'm going to ask Ann to put it back up on the screen and to think through a little bit about what the Apostle Paul is saying to the early Christians who are beginning to form this kind of community and some of the guidelines that Paul offers to us in that. One of the first things Paul says in this opening is that Paul warns us against what he calls unwholesome talk or unwholesome speech. Now, communication is thing that, which is more than talk, and so we're going to broaden that a little bit and talk about unwholesome communication in regard to that. But what does Paul mean by that? What's Paul saying, unwholesome? That's not a term we use a great deal. That's not something that's part of, part of my everyday vocabulary. So what's Paul talking about? What does he mean, unwholesome conversation, unwholesome communication? Well, fortunately, Paul goes on to give us a little definition around that. And a part of that definition is in the words that follow immediately after that. Paul says, wholesome conversation, the opposite of unwholesome, wholesome conversation contains at least two ingredients. One is it needs to be helpful. And the other is it needs to build up. It needs to be supportive. It needs to be nurturing. It needs to be encouraging. Those two things are a part of that. So if we look at that and we think about, okay, wholesome conversation is conversation that is helpful, not hurtful, and it is conversation that builds up and does not tear down. And he goes on to add a third dynamic in the words that follow that as you're reading along. That conversation should be helpful, 
It should be building and it should be focused on the needs of the individual to whom you're addressing or speaking. Now let me illustrate an opposite here for a moment. And this has probably happened in all of our lives. Don't raise your hands. I just believe it has. If you're like me, at some point in your life, you've been in that situation where you've said, I'm going to tell them exactly what I think. Now, two things about that. One, it probably has very little to do with what you think. It has an awful lot to do with what you feel. And the other is, it's probably a lot more about your need than it is theirs. Those are the kind of things that Paul is looking at and saying that those are not wholesome. That's not a wholesome conversation. That's not wholesome communication. It doesn't meet this criteria. It may not be helpful, probably will not be helpful. It's not about building up. It's about my needs, not your needs. It's about what I feel rather than what I think. All of those things are a part of that. Earlier in this text, in the verses just before this, Paul talks about another dynamic. And Paul says, put away all falsehood. Which Paul simply says, you shouldn't lie to each other. Now, there's an interesting thing in that for me. Because my experience is not every truth about my life is a compliment. Is that true for you? It's not all good news when you're talking about Larry. Sometimes it's not good news. And so how, does, how do we do wholesome speech when what I need to say in order to be honest is not what you want to hear in order to be truthful? And I think it goes back to what Paul is just talking about. Why are you doing it? And how are you doing it? The truth of my life is this. Sometimes I need somebody who loves and cares about me to tell me a hard truth about myself that I'm not going to celebrate and I don't want to hear. But it is helpful to me It builds me up because it helps to form me more to be the person that God wants me to be and created me to be, and it is about what I need. Not what I want, but it is about what I need. And how do we do that in this dynamic? Because the last part of what Paul says in that phrase, is so important. He says, and for those who listen to it, it is a benefit to them. Now, when I I read that, I don't think Paul's just talking about the one person you may be talking to. I think he's talking about the people who may be listening. Because this is the real deep quality of what can happen in Christian community, which I don't think happens in a lot of other places, and that is this. To live in an environment where people who love and care about you can share a hard truth with you with so much love and compassion that those who hear it are blessed by it in this way, that when my day comes to hear a hard truth, I will hear it with the same love and compassion that that person did. And it will be about my need, not somebody else's anger or arrogance or feelings or whatever it may be. But it will be for my good. It will be to help me. It will be to build me up. We don't often live with that kind of trust. We don't often live in that kind of intimacy. We don't often live in a community. And as I said earlier, we don't always get it right either. But do you see what Paul is talking about here? 
Paul is trying to talk about living with each other, valuing the important relationships in your life and your world, nurturing those relationships, strengthening those relationships. And why? Because you can't have a rich life without them. You can't have an abundant life without them. You can't live the life God wants you to live without those relationships being strong and healthy and you feeling good about them and others feeling good about them as well. There's an organization called Natural Church Development. They've been around for decades. And one of the things they did early when they formed, they did a lot of research with churches and they found out that healthy churches tend to have eight core dynamics, eight core qualities. You know what one of those qualities is? Loving relationships. That there's really no such thing as a healthy church that doesn't have loving relationships. Because when people come here, yeah, they come here to know that God loves them. But I think we also all come here to understand that other people love me too. That I am an important part of a group of people and they, co- and they care about me and they love me. Where does that happen in the life of the church? Well, you know, we love on each other a little bit in the worship service, but really not very much. You get a few minutes to give somebody a quick hug, uh, to shake a hand, to say something to them, but the, for the most part, you're just kind of sitting there listening. So where does that happen? My life experience it typically happens in a much smaller group than the worship service. It happens in a Sunday school class. It happens in a small study group. It happens in a service group like a choir or a group that gathers for ministry, like Feeder of the Pack. It it happens where people gather in small groups and enter into conversation and get to know each other and build relationships with each other. If you want to be involved in the life of a church and feel like you are loved and you are cared for and you know other people and you love them, the best avenue for you to do that is to invest yourself somewhere in a small group. I'm going to have the ushers hand out a brochure right now and it's just a resource for you and it talks about small groups in the life of our church, where they are, how you can get involved with them. There's a meeting coming up about that as well. And I just want to say as they do this, that's that's the very best environment for you to connect with that and for this to happen in your world and for this to happen in your life. God created the church to be a place that nurtured this avenue in your life, as well as others, but nurtured this one. And I encourage you to be a part of it and to take advantage of it. And if you haven't yet, to find that little bit of community that you can belong to and that can belong to you. Would you bow your heads with me in a word of prayer? Gracious and loving God, Lord, thanks for giving us this this church. Thanks for giving us this opportunity to, to be together Thanks for giving us a place to to share and a place to serve and a place to give and a place to receive. But more than anything, God, a place to be loved. Help us to find that place, Lord, in your kingdom and in the life of your church, in our own homes, in our own families. And help us to remember the guideline of wholesome conversation that speaks into our lives and speaks into our world. In your name we pray, amen. I'm going to take just a second.